Welcome to New America. I am Peter Bergen, and we're here to discuss a new paper, an assessment of variation in national processes of defining and designating terrorist groups, which is published today and is available uh, at the bottom of your screen. Um, we're talking to two of the authors uh, of the report, David Sturman and Melissa salik Verk. Uh, David is a senior policy analyst at New America. Melissa is a fellow at New America. And we're also uh, honored to have Ambassador Edmund Fitton Brown, uh, former uh, ambassador from uh, to Yemen from Britain, and also he ran the UN monitoring cell for Taliban and Al Qaeda. Um, and so we will start um, with uh, Melissa, who's going to give an overview. Then we'll go to David, and then we'll have uh, Ambassador Fitton Brown uh, comment on the report. Melissa, great, thank you so much, Peter. So to begin with, this assessment aims to map various approaches to national designation practices and also help to enable future analysis of variations in designation practices that impact policy efforts by social media companies and governments alike. And so we formulated our list of countries based on Encyclopedia Britannica, which gave us 196 countries. And so everything was open source from government websites to news coverage governmental and non-governmental assessments and review of counterterrorism law. And so, of course, with this process, we identified some limitations. So when performing a global analysis, this process yielded several limitations, such as language barriers, local knowledge barriers. And in order to navigate that challenge as an English language focused team, we contracted supplemental research from individuals proficient in Spanish, French, and Arabic to kind of fill in those any perceived gaps. In addition, that means it's possible that several countries may have a designation list, but we could not find it. In cases where we had breadcrumbs possibly leading us to more conclusive lists, for example, like in the Netherlands, we reached out to contacts and relevant government ministries to ask our questions and confirm interpretations of media reports or government documents. And so David will speak about this a bit more, but we also saw variation in designation and definition practices. So as you might suspect, in our research, we found that different countries have different protocols for assessing and designating terrorist groups. And so some included sanctions of specific people or terrorist entities. And every practice of designation is different. So vast generalizations cannot be made about these processes. And there's also geopolitical factors that must be taken into account as to why some countries designate specific groups and then others do not. And so there are also some key terms throughout a report that I think are worth noting. The term designation is used for countries that have labeled at least one group as a terrorist entity, done so by either official government statement or unofficial media reports. It's more than simply stating an act of terrorism occurred. And then terrorist designation goes beyond groups violating a country's constitution, for example. So we also focused on national level designations. And we found that most, if not all countries we researched had some form of sanctioning to implement the UN sanctions on Al Qaeda and ISIS. And furthermore, some countries have processes for commitments to designation lists issued by international bodies, such as the European Union's list of terror groups. But if they don't have a list of their own for designating terrorist groups, we don't list them as having a national designation list. We also chose to identify types of designations, such as prescription and criminalization of membership support entry prohibitions to limiting individuals tied to a designated group, asset-focused sanctions as outlined in UN Security Council Resolution 1373, asset freezes or other seizure of assets short of a criminal conviction, and unknown enforcement measures or other. And then last, we have domestic entities coded if countries designate an entity or if we found the group has a substantial military, organizational, or governing presence inside the country we researched. So as far as UN resolutions, we focused on driving our analysis based on the following. UN Security Council Resolution 1373, which passed in 2001, among other things discusses terrorist financing and notes that all states shall take a range of actions, such as criminalizing the possession and collection of funds, quote, by their nationals or in their territories with the intention that the funds should be used or in the knowledge that they are to be used in order to carry out terrorist acts, unquote. 
And so states maintain their own lists of whose assets should be frozen. And that's something that I think is really important for us to focus on. Then in 2005, Security Council Resolution 1624 condemned the glorification of terrorism and called on states to prohibit incitement of terrorist violence. Our analysis also draw, draws from 1999 Security Council Resolution 1267, which designated Al Qaeda, Taliban, Osama bin Laden, or persons and entities associated with them with committing all UN members to freeze those groups and individuals' assets. And then in 2011, UNSCR 1989 separated the Al Qaeda and Taliban lists due to the Taliban's reconciliation with the government of Afghanistan at the time. So some members of the Taliban were believed to have rejected extremist or terrorist ideologies of Al Qaeda and supported a possible peaceful resolution of the continuing conflict in Afghanistan, which we know things have changed since then and we'll also be addressing today. In 2015, UNSCR 2253 extended sanctions to individuals and entities tied to ISIS. And then in 2022, UNSCR 2624, expanded prior sanctions and referred to Yemen's Houthi rebels as the, quote, Houthi terrorist group, unquote. So there are other sanctioning regimes by the UN that apply to groups considered by the United States and other countries to be terrorist organizations, such as al-Shabaab. So one example of this is UNSCR 751, and related resolutions aimed at sanctioning entities, quote, engaged or providing support for acts that threaten the peace, security, or stability of Somalia, including acts that threaten the peace and reconciliation process in Somalia, or obstruct, undermine, or threaten the federal government of Somalia, Amisom, or UNSAM by force, unquote, along with a variety of more specific inclusion criteria. So however, Al-Shabaab is not listed on the Al-Qaeda and ISIS sanctions list. And then the UN General Assembly adopted its global counterterrorism strategy in 2006, calling on member states to have more collaborative efforts in combating the spread of terrorism. And that plan is reviewed and updated every two years. And so with all of these UN resolutions, it helped to kind of frame the approach that we were taking to make sure that we were taking language to help specify what does it mean to have a designation? What does it not mean? And David's gonna give us a really good example of some of the highlights from the report, and he'll give us a deeper dive in our findings. So thanks, David. Thank you, Melissa. Thanks. So as Melissa mentions, I'm going to run through some of the key findings and then what they might say about the broader designation um, landscape. I'm going to run pretty quickly through these and then hopefully we can discuss in more detail. So as mentioned, our report looks at 196 countries focused on the question of, do these countries have national designations? Our first finding that Lissa spoke quite well about is that designations are complex and the, there's variation at multiple levels across these. This is both um, a key finding, but also a limitation to the application and use of this data that should be kept in mind. And when I say variation, I mean variation over who is designated, but also variation in the process. As Melissa mentioned, whether um, the groups or any participation in the group is criminalized at the higher level through sort of acid freezes and sanctions down to whether it's just symbolic or as a way of organizing um, or structuring intelligence sharing. There's also differences in the extent of executive control over the process, differences in the extent of whether information on designations are public or even whether the legal system that is making designations nationally is a solid legal system or is run a little bit by royal or other absolute dicta. Some countries have multiple authorities. Here in the United States, we have the foreign terrorist organization list, which a lot of people focus on, but there's also the specially designated global terrorist list and sanctions run largely by treasury. There's also a terrorist exclusion list specific to immigration policy. Some countries also use authorities that are not specifically about terrorism, and sometimes those authorities blur into um, pretty specific approaches that then use them and frame it as a counterterrorism tool. 
So with those cautions, we found that 60 countries appear to have some kind of national designation beyond their commitments to the UN sanctions or their regional body commitments. That's 31% of the sample. Um, some regions appear to have more architecture, in particular North America, although that's just the US and Canada in our regional schema, and South Asia have high rates of architecture. Others have far less. We found very little in Sub-Saharan Africa, very little in Oceania, excepting New Zealand and Australia, and very little, although some in the rest of the Americas, South America, Central America, and the Caribbean. An important issue our report um, helps bring to light is the existence of significant global differences over designation. Um, this occurs even within peaceful and largely integrated regions. For example, the European Union was historically split on whether to designate Hezbollah. And even more recently, after they designated the armed wing, there continue to be splits within the bloc and Europe more generally over um, whether to designate only the armed wing or parts of Hezbollah or to designate it in its entirety. Even the United States and Canada have disagreements. Canada has designated the Proud Boys, while the United States has not. Part of the reason for that is that the United States strenuously avoids designating or calling domestic groups terrorist organizations. Although, as we note in the paper and has been discussed, there's been some politicization and um, signs that some people are not happy with that. However, that puts the United States at odds with um, many of the other countries, at least those that have national designations. Our count is that 72% of those that have a national designation, according to our criteria, have also designated a group that is largely domestically based. There are also geopolitical disputes returning to Hezbollah. Syria and Iran viewed the group as legitimate and indeed important for their national security strategies, and Russia does not designate the group. With regard to the Muslim Brotherhood, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, and Egypt have all done designations regarding the group and a other linked um, groups to the Muslim Brotherhood, something that puts um, that ties into a broader competition between those countries and countries like Qatar, Turkey, and others that have more friendly relations with the Muslim Brotherhood and Muslim Brotherhood affiliated groups. The US and Iran have both designated parts of each other's governments as terrorist organizations. The US did this for the first time with its foreign terrorist organization list under Trump designating the IRGC. Um, the Soleimani assassination then caused a surge in Iranian reaction to that and a series of Iranian sanctions on U.S. government and other Americans, as well as others that it blamed for the assassination or sought to connect to it. But there's also a prior history. In 2007, Iran passed a non-binding resolution calling U.S. forces in the Middle East terrorists, and that was partly tied to the geopolitical competition, but it was also partly an explicit tit-for-tat dispute with the U.S. over designations and framed as reaction to calls for the United States to designate the IRGC at that time. Now the U.K. appears to be considering a designation of its own, as well as others are considering it, and there's a tie-in to designation debates in Yemen around the Houthi group, um, which we can discuss later. There's also been a push among many to designate groups tied to the far um, right or white supremacist groups that was energized um, by a wave of white supremacist attacks, including globally, for example, in Christchurch, but also the one six events here in DC. There has been an effect. We identified 12 groups that appear to be designated in some form and five countries that have made such designations as part of this generalized push. Um, however, institutionalization is limited, especially um, beyond the Five Eyes countries. Um, there are also some side cases we discuss in the report. Um, there are also other limits. There's been a connection to geopolitical disputes, specifically in the conflict and war in Ukraine, that we address how that has played out a bit in the report. And there's also questions about the character of the threat and whether this kind of designation is really responsive to what many see as a threat defined by lone actors or small cells and not the kind of groups that at least traditionally have been seen as driving designation questions at the group level.
Finally, we have to look for the potential for change, as Melissa mentioned, and we'll discuss more, the collapse of the um, Afghan government following the U.S. withdrawal. It's really reshaped a whole range of sanctions questions, raising a number of issues. I mentioned that January 6th really helped drive sort of a push for further um, designations. Well, we just saw similar riots and um, events in Brazil. We may see or we may not see um, further spinning out of legal architecture from that or any future similar events. And then finally, as we were writing and finalizing this report, Somalia began to spin out a series of um, executive statements establishing legal architecture or at least statements of legal architecture regarding al-Shabaab in a way that did not appear to really exist in the same way before. Um, and with that, I turn it over. Thank you, David. Ambassador? Ambassador, I think you're on mute. Apologies, I should have learned to get that right. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you. Um, and thanks for including me in this fascinating discussion. Uh, this is an important report on a topic that needs to be re-examined at a time when the easy post 9-11 consensus on counterterrorism is being challenged in terms of where the main threat comes from, in terms of international common purpose on tackling it, and in terms of resourcing the effort. My own background gives me experience of both policy and practice of counterterrorism, first with the British government and then with the UN. I'll try to offer insights from those perspectives rather than a more general commentary on this excellent assessment, which Melissa and David have already covered so well. I should briefly highlight some aspects of the UN approach to CT. The monitoring team, which I coordinated until July, is mandated by Security Council resolutions to assess and support sanctions on ISIL, Al Qaeda, and the Taliban. There's a kind of a cousin body in the UN called the Counterterrorism Executive Directorate, which works to a different Security Council committee and set of resolutions. CTED works on a much wider set of terrorist groups and issues than the monitoring team does. Then you have the UN Office of Counterterrorism, the largest UN CT agency, but it doesn't come under the Security Council and so it has different governance. I don't have time to go into this now, but we'll be happy to say more if asked about mandates and how this UNCT architecture works. I will instead just offer a few reflections to help stimulate the discussion that Peter will moderate. The report mentions the 1267 regime and alludes to its widespread automatic implementation, at least in legal terms, because member states have a mechanism to comply and demonstrate compliance. This is particularly striking in the EU where the stroke of a pen in New York leads to almost instantaneous implementation in 27 countries. But in terms of, uh, but in terms of uh, practical impact, how many bank accounts are frozen? How many terrorists are disrupted? How much financial institutions and other private entities invest in total compliance? Neither 1267 nor any other UN sanctions regime has anything like the international impact of US Treasury sanctions. Now, the report highlights definitional issues, including the lack of an agreed international definition of terrorism. The great strength of the 1267 list is that it doesn't need a definition. It is group specific. And ISIL and Al Qaeda represent such a brutal nihilistic streak of terrorism that it is easy to reach international agreement on taking measures against them. ISIL has no friends. Al-Qaeda, very few. That said, there is much OCT, CTED, and others can and do contribute on counterterrorism. As was famously said of pornography, we hesitate to define terrorism, but we know it when we see it. I wanted to clarify a couple of points in the report. Concerning al-Shabaab, it is not beyond the scope of 1267, because it is an established and proudly self-avowed affiliate of al-Qaeda, and its leader is one of the top five global leaders of Al-Qaeda. But the convention has been to deal with it under the Somalia sanctions regime, partly because that has a humanitarian carve out. It will be interesting to see what happens now that resolution 2664, which was passed last month, has introduced a humanitarian exemption to other UN sanctions, including 1267. Regarding the ISIL provinces in Africa, 
we should be clear that they were already sanctioned by the UN, US and others because of their association with ISIL. Individual designation is of more symbolic than practical value. And there is no consensus on exactly how far to pursue these individual designations, sometimes because member states are reluctant to highlight that they have an ISIL problem, sometimes because the groups themselves crave the implicit respect and recognition. A rabble of extremists, bandits and thugs may well take such recognition as a badge of honor. It can become a self-fulfilling prophecy that ultimately attracts money, resources and foreign terrorist fighters to that group. UN Security Council CT resolutions are sometimes described negatively as imposed legislation by Security Council fiat. Member states are keen to comply, especially with chapter seven resolutions, but these resolutions are not always drafted with the legal precision that would be required to draft laws in a member state. And the business tempo of the Security Council takes no account of member state capacity to implement. This can give right, rise to human rights and other concerns around compliance with competing legal obligations. My view is that the Security Council needs to be more cautious in drafting new CT resolutions. Of course, Security Council dynamics are a crucial ingredient in this. That is a new, but also an old consideration. It was no easier to achieve Security Council unanimity before the 1990s than it is now. We may therefore come to regard the heyday of CT resolutions from 1999 to 2017 as an exceptional era. The report mentions the Financial Action Task Force, and I would just highlight how extraordinarily effective that body has been in its field. Its weakness is its limited membership, but it has much wider impact. It has a working definition of terrorism, and it has a lack of squeamishness about criticizing member states' performance on CT and a track record of driving behavior change. This is worthy of closer study for lessons learned. So what next? It will be important to sustain international consensus on CT, especially at a time when other priorities, geostrategic or environmental, are asserting themselves. The report points out that this consensus is already fragile, indeed absent in the case of many strains of terrorism. Far-right extremism or white supremacist terrorism or uh, ethnically or religiously motivated or motivated by xenophobia or racism, uh, intolerance or religious belief. These are sometimes abbreviated to ERM or XRIRB. These are a particularly vexed area, as the report indicates. Controversy over terminology reflects controversy over definition. And an issue that arouses US domestic sensitivities over the Proud Boys and Russian sensitivities over Ukraine is hardly likely to see consensus action in the Security Council anytime soon. So let's stick to what we can agree on. If a regime like 1267 is working reasonably well, it makes sense to evolve it incrementally. The 2664 humanitarian experiment will need careful monitoring. As for chapter seven resolutions on new threats, those will only be driven by seismic events with strategic international impact. The white supremacists or XRIRB terrorists have not yet had their 9-11 moment or their so-called caliphate moment. And the issue will elude the Security Council until they do. None of which prevents OCT, CTED and others from continuing, expanding and improving the excellent work that they already do to build member state CT capacity relevant to all of the terrorist threats that member states face. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. I also wanted to draw attention to Brianna K. Black, who um, was one of the co-authors of this report. Um, a couple of questions for the Ambassador to just kick things off with. You were Ambassador in Yemen. You had to obviously think pretty hard about the Houthi problem. So what, who, what are the constituencies that want to designate the Houthis as a terrorist group? And if you are willing to answer this, I mean, is that a reasonable kind of conclusion? They are, after all, 
sending Iranian-made drones into Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates, on the other hand, both of those countries have sort of, in, at one time or another, have both sent their armed forces into Yemen. So how do you land on all that? Yeah, it's a, it was a complicated um, uh, discussion that led to the um, Security Council resolution that was referred to in the report, but, it, but nevertheless, it was, it was agreed. Uh, and I think this was brought about by the increasingly reckless attacks that the Houthis were launching uh, on Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. Um, and eventually, you know, as I said, with terrorism, you, you know it when you see it, however difficult the definition is. And there was a level, I think, of recklessness about um, potential, uh, uh, potential civilian casualties, um, uh, sort of reckless uh, e economic damage, damaged infrastructure, damage potentially to international uh, aviation stability, security, um, that I think drove that consensus, um, which, which led to the resolution. That said, it wasn't easy to reach. It probably would have been re reached sooner if the Houthis had been you know, a little bit more indiscriminately reckless sooner. The more that they behave like a militia that is fighting for control of territory in Yemen rather than a terrorist group that's trying to um, uh, bother, bother their neighbors, uh, the less likely it is that that sort of international consensus can be reached against them. And of course, it's, it's obviously true that any, any group that is uh, rather than ISIL, sort of a nihilistic death cult, um, if, it's, if it's more of a sort of a state-sponsored group that straddles uh, militia activity and terrorism like the Houthis, then again, it will always be harder to achieve uh, Security Council unanimity, unanimity against it. Is there a sort of slippery slope problem, which, which uh, he, he, you know, I'll be the advocate for that, which is, um, the report mentions, of course, that the Trump administration designated the R IRGC, the Revolutionary Guard Corps, uh, in Iran. Uh, David mentioned that the British are contemplating perhaps designating the group. And then also Iran has sort of done a tit for tat with elements of the United States. And the Houthis themselves are an interesting because they are the de facto government of much of Yemen. You know, at what point does this sort of degenerate into because I mean terrorism as is kind of commonly understood is by non-state actors uh, against civilians now there may be a state component which is supporting that but when you start designating elements of a government are we sort of on a slippery slope where what we're talking about is so capacious that it becomes um, unmanageable yeah I think it's a it's a, it's a very fair warning Peter um, I mean of course this has always been the case that that periodically um, member states will accuse one another of uh, support for terrorism or accuse one another of outright terrorism. Uh, and I think you have to be careful with definitions here. And I agree that those kind of accusations inevitably drive retaliatory accusations, which may just muddy the waters and make things more difficult. At the same time, there's certain types of activity where it's difficult to refrain from making the accusation. So mm. I, I, I don't want to preach on this, but it's one of the reasons that I said in my opening remarks that, you know, where you have um, a sort of a ring fenced uh, set of sanctions like the ones that uh, apply against uh, Al Qaeda and, the ta and, uh, and ISIL, uh, it's worth sort of trying to hold on to that as a single regime and evolve it with international consensus. And I'll just quickly mention the point, the humanitarian point again. Uh, this is another point where you've got uh, terrorist groups that control territory. And you mentioned the Houthis in Yemen. You could equally have mentioned the Taliban in Afghanistan. Um, the Taliban are obviously uh, not uh, treated as a terrorist group by the UN, but they are treated as a terrorist group by a number of member states. Um, and of course, then you've got humanitarian groups needing to talk to the de facto authorities to gain access. And access and to deliver humanitarian assistance. Uh, and so you, you run into difficulties over, uh, over that sort of, you know, uh, how, how you, how you uh, indemnify that kind of activity against the accusation that is supporting the terrorist group.
Yeah, just a clarification on that. So this 2664 resolution in the UN, which uh, I'm getting, it, which passed last month, allows member states to deal with the Taliban, even though the UN, you were running the monitoring cell. And uh, in your most recent report, I think you said 41 of the cabinet or sub cabinet were designated not as terrorists, but as threatening to the peace of Afghanistan. So does this carve out, allow it, make it easier for member states or NGOs to deal with the Taliban de facto government? So the, so the carve out um, uh, doesn't, or, I mean, it does apply to, to 1988, but it, it, did, it wasn't needed for 1988, which is the Taliban sanctions regime, because the, the United, United Nations Security Council had already passed resolution 2615, um, which was passed much sooner after the Taliban took de facto power in Afghanistan. And that was a resolution that specifically uh, provided that exemption in the case of humanitarian delivery in Afghanistan. So 2664 was passed for the full range of UN sanctions. And in terms of the conversation we're having, it would be more relevant, for example, to humanitarian delivery in Idlib, where the uh, controlling authority is uh, Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, uh, which is a 1267 sanctioned group. And, and part of Al-Qaeda, effectively, or they've had a back and forth, but uh, Al-Qaeda yeah. aligned, let's say. Ex exactly. So just picking up on some of those, uh, Melissa and David, um, so, and the report points out the Russians have designated the Azov Battalion, which is now the Azov Regiment, which is now part of the Ukrainian army. Um, and then, you know, there's also been just some discussion of the Wagner group being designated as a terrorist group. It does not clear how far that has gone. But uh, do, Melissa, do you have any thoughts on, on those designations or potential designations? I think it makes for a really complicated scenario because like we've talked about with some of these other groups, depending on what the geopolitical aspect is with different nations and their affiliations with them or the work that they've done with them, having some designations of specific groups makes it very complicated. And so there's not really a one size fits all process for some of these things, um, especially when it comes to different aspects with real-time conflict, like we're seeing in Ukraine and Russia, having these different groups saying, well, I'm going to designate this group because it's going against what my geopolitical wishes are in the region. It's a very interesting piece as it comes about. I think the other piece about having different groups that may have been more, uh, I would say more right-leaning in, in this particular context, um, and having some, I guess, complicated, I'm trying to say this <laughs> very politically correct, but just, uh, I guess, questionable tactics and things that they've done. Um, but now having those groups be affiliated with kind of a movement in Ukraine, for example, to be at the front lines of everything, um, I guess, tactics change, ideas change. And so... What makes it challenging, I would say, is when you designate a group and then you see that things are changing in real time in terms of their focus, then trying to walk that back becomes a very complicated process. And I think in the United States, we're seeing that a lot as well, too, between one administration to the next, what does it, who designates a group and who pulls it back kind of a thing. So I think the long and short of it is it's really complicated depending on the context of the time and who's involved and what their end goal is. And these are, David, highly politicized decisions. I mean, I, and I'm I also to the ambassador. I mean, I guess the UN, ISIS and Al-Qaeda, everybody can agree on almost entirely <laughs> that these are bad groups. But then once you get below that, it, it's more complicated. So, David, on the Wagner group, what do you think will happen or what's brewing on that issue. Yeah, I'm I'm not sure what's growing on that, but I agree on both the politicization question and also the complicatedness. And I think we've seen um, sort of the early signs that these things can trip up policymakers. Um, so in the paper, we cite that there was, I think, a very relatively low importance instance where the Japanese have a sort of analytical or public facing product that's just, here's a bunch of terrorist groups. It's not 
at least according to them, tied to any um, material law enforcement aspect. It's just public info. And they went back and, um, according to the statements we saw, edited that regarding the Azov, which then um, got picked up by various Russian affiliated or um, news and news that's sort of aligned with it, pointing out that backtracking. Um, and you saw some similar wavering um, in the US domestic sphere. Um, and I think there's a way in which um, at first blush, many of these far right groups in the US context, there's an assumption that, well, these wouldn't have any geopolitical consequences. It's not like the Houthis. There's no aspect. And I I think that um, that can be misleading. And some of these cases either clearly do have connections into larger conflicts, or they can suddenly become part, um, which is but David, I want just to a, note a little bit of the like interlinking that. Yeah, but David, just a little clarification yeah. about this, because I mean, my understanding is, you know, it's complicated in the United States with these domestic terrorist groups or right wing extremist groups, because um, the designation comes from primarily through the State Department and their foreign terrorist organizations. And so while it would be a crime for me to try and join ISIS or send money to ISIS, um, it would be quite within my First Amendment rights to be a member of Proud Boy. I might if I committed a crime like the Proud Boys who are being charged with seditious conspiracy, that's a different matter. But, you know, you can't you can't criminalize uh, because of the First Amendment uh, joining one of these groups in the United States in a way that you can criminalize joining or attempting to join or supporting or providing material support to a group like ISIS. Is that correct? Um, mostly, I think the standard interpretation is that there's no or very limited authority to target these structures against domestic groups. Um, I don't think it's clear necessarily that you could, there's no way you could interpret it that way. And of course, um, as an American, you can be charged if there's the foreignness of the organization, which perhaps opens some space. And we saw that um, with the Trump administration's attempt to put Antifa on the um, terrorist exclusion list, which raised a whole range of questions, both is this meaningfully an organization, um, which I think it's not, or at least the way they were framing it, it didn't refer to a meaningful organization, but also the domestic question. But that didn't stop um, them from at least floating that up. So, um, but I think that is sort of an issue and you see these calls for domestic designation and then the challenges around it. Um, I think also we see this question of, um, is are these even groups in a lot of questions or is it useful to conceive of them as groups? Um, which we cite a bad of, um, document that raises that concern when they went and um, tried to talk through what can be done on the right wing, extreme right wing side and what exists already. Well, let me, uh, let me ask the ambassador a question about that because one of the big issues, and I, this, if anybody in the audience has questions, please put them in the Slido and I'll just give them to, the, to our panelists as they come in. So the Muslim Brotherhood is a group. It's also a movement. I mean, you can be a Muslim brother without, you know, it's, it, it sort of depends on which country you're in and, and um, a lot of others. So the, the criminalization, the, the designation by the Saudis, and then, of course, in Turkey, you've got effectively a Muslim brother with government to some degree and elements of the Jordanian parliament and, and Kuwait. And, and, of course, Qatar is, a, uh, until recently, you know, uh, the, one of the leaders of the movement, uh, the cleric uh, who just recently died, was living in Qatar. So how does this all, what are the real world implications of all this? And the kind of, because part of the, one of the reasons we're trying to do this is trying to explain to as much as possible that this is really complicated. Um, and obviously this has big implications for social media companies, for people doing business in these countries, potentially for a whole wider range of things. And of course, for politics. So how do you how do you try to untangle, for instance, the Muslim Brotherhood and the real world, world implications of these, some groups being banned or not banned, depending on which country you're in? 
Yeah, it's a it's a great question, and I mean, it's been it's been a very complicated thing for people to deal with over the years. And you'll remember very well, you know, the the sort of controversy that was generated by the number of uh, Muslim Brotherhood aligned uh, leaders present in the United Kingdom, which mm. gave the United Kingdom a bad reputation with a number of uh, of our uh, Middle Eastern partners, um, and that's not entirely uh, been dealt with. Um, I think the 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 point that the UK would make on this is that, you know, you, you can't likely um, designate a group as a terrorist group. You have to be absolutely clear that they fulfill certain criteria as a terrorist group. And the UK view was that the Muslim Brotherhood did not fulfill those criteria. It was that the Muslim Brotherhood was a, a dissident group or, a, you know, an opposition group. Um, and then you get into this interesting point, where is, where is the overlap between extremist ideology and violent terrorism? And that, that, that I think, is where you get the real uh, sort of nuance about where you draw that line. And you can legitimately uh, have a debate about this. So, you know, I, can, I have some sympathy with some of the critics of the, you know, the, of, of, the, of the UK on this, but I also understand why the UK takes the position that it does. Um, you also get into some interesting I intricacies in places like Yemen, where some of the um, government forces uh, are aligned with the Muslim Brotherhood. Some of the government forces are aligned with Salafism, uh, and that can create different tensions within the uh, coalition with uh, the Saudi, with the Saudis on the one hand, with the Emiratis on the other hand. So this is not an easy thing to deal with. It's one of the reasons why I think it's quite important to have a high bar for saying this is unquestionably a terrorist group. And there I do see uh, one point I want to make is, is I, I see an inherent uh, benefit to international peace and security of having some level of Security Council agreement on this point. It's one of the, one of the great things about the 1267 sanctions regime is it brings the Security Council together when there's very little they can agree on, when their daggers drawn on so many other issues they nevertheless can sit down and agree on designating or taking measures against ISIL or Al Qaeda. And that creates a habit of negotiation and compromise, which I think is valuable. Yeah, um, Ambassador, Melissa wanted to ask you a couple of questions on, on these points. Thank you. So Ambassador, I just wanted to circle back just to the beginning of something that you had said in your opening remarks. Um, you had mentioned, I think, member state capacity and then legal, legal obligations that make it complicated for UN resolutions to be implemented. So I just wanted to comment on that and then see if you could expand a little bit, if you don't mind. Um, I was thinking that, you know, one of the trickiest things is for the, the UN setup is writing a resolution that can be passed in such a way that, you know, voting member states are, are going to sign on to it. Um, it's really a delicate dance of the UN and it's kind of like one of the beautiful things, but also one of the most complicated things is because you have to accommodate these various cultural, geopolitical, transnational factors, creating resolutions that speak to all of the member states. Do you have anything to respond to that? I just wanted to make a comment about it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, I think what you make a, an important point and, you know, of course, the governments engaged in the Security Council, these are serious governments and they're seriously well resourced. And the process of um, drafting and passing a Security Council resolution is a, it's a solemn process. And I, I, I don't want to trivialize that at all. It's, a, it's hugely impressive to watch it happening. But nevertheless, the Security Council has a rhythm of business. It has a certain number of issues it has to get through. It has limited time. And once you enter the negotiation phase, you're going to have trade-offs. And those trade-offs will be checked with capitals and they will, be, they will have all of the legal checks done, but you're still unlikely to end up with a draft that has the level of thoroughness that you would get in a carefully legally drafted domestic piece of legislation. And so there is a, there is a tension there. You pass a resolution and it imposes an obligation you know, you know, a good example would be uh, uh, would be um, the uh, resolutions that deal with uh, how you address foreign terrorist fighters who travel to fight with, uh, you know, on the side of ISIL. Um, now, those resolutions that were passed by the uh, by the UN, they're very good resolutions, and they were needed. They were needed to provide some kind of 
international thought leadership on this new problem, which governments had not dealt with before and had been wrong footed by it because they weren't expecting their nationals to jump up and go and fight in a foreign conflict and all of the things that followed from that. And I actually think those are rather good resolutions, but it is interesting that even now, years later, years since the first of them was passed, um, you know, many member states are still not fully in compliance with them. Um, and so what you're doing is you're, 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 you're putting member states in a position where they struggle because of their state capacity, but also because of the, you know, um, countervailing obligations um, you know, they may, they, this is a this is a very common discussion within the UN is is counterterrorism versus human rights obligations versus versus human rights uh, versus uh, humanitarian access obligations and other rule of law considerations. Um, you you can set up tensions in that area. Uh, they're not insuperable tensions, but I think I think all of that points to the wisdom of the Security Council uh, avoiding hyperactivity in this area. I think that's actually a fantastic point because you have all of these different UN entities that each have, at the end of the day, it's the same goal, regardless of whether or not it's coming from a counterterrorism perspective, it's coming from a peace building perspective, you know, regardless of what that angle is, the, the end goal is the same, preventing violence. Um, but I think the point that you made about foreign terrorist fighters returning is actually a great example because you have a lot of states that have very specific rules about not allowing people to come back and then who is the burden on right so when they get to the border and they can't go then they may end up in a place where there's not enough infrastructure to support them in the way that they would have been able to come back in that capacity then you have other states that have a very different approach and they want to bring them back in put them kind of through a a new process of coming back into the culture, reassimilating, if you will, and it's just very different approaches. So I'm really glad you brought that up. That's that's a great point. Well, following up on that, you know, so the Al Hol camp, you know, which has got tens of thousands of women and children, many of whom are sort of affiliated with ISIS in some shape or form. I mean, it seems an ambassador, uh, no, you know, some France has taken a handful back, and the Iraqis and Syrians have taken some back. But I mean, right now, what's the state of play there? Do you think? Well, it, it's it's gradually improving, um, but it's not improving quickly enough. I mean, the numbers in Al Hol are, are significantly down on where they were a couple of years ago, um, and in terms of the sort of uh, the main contributors to that development, I mean, I think the Iraqis did deserve a special mention because you know they're having to deal with a vast internally displaced problem of their own, and yet they are also accepting people back from Syria. So I think they deserve a good deal of credit for that. Um, I think the uh, Kazakhstan and some of the other Central Asian countries have been leaders in this. Um, and it's true that Western Europe, I don't want to, it's not just Western Europe and it's not all of Western Europe, but, but you know, Western Europe has been hesitant in this area. Um, the problem is that it's, a, it's an unprecedented issue and issues without precedent then are slow to resolve themselves or to be resolved. And so there's been a lot of international effort that's gone into this, but there remain a lot of complications that cause people to say, well, this is difficult and we can't move too quickly. And often it's domestic political considerations where you actually have a, uh, you know, politicians afraid that uh, they bring one person back and it goes wrong. Uh, it could cause them uh, severe electoral difficulties. Um, but I think what, what the monitoring team has always sought to emphasize on this point is that the, the trouble that is being stored up by not proactively addressing this issue is much greater than the trouble if you do proactively address it. And uh, obviously, you know, we're now several years on from the fall of the so-called caliphate. Um, you know, if you're dealing with somebody who is 14 years old, you could have dealt with them when they were seven. You've got a whole new complicated intractable set of issues and so that that's why we've always said please you know we have to get we have to get on the front foot with this issue and you know many members of the international community deserve a lot of credit for doing exactly that but the process still needs to be accelerated 
Okay, we have some audience questions. So first one directed at you, uh, Ambassador from Nazrana Youth Society at Voice of America. Um, I mean, we've discussed a little bit of this, but millions of girls are being denied their very basic rights, et cetera. Um, you know, where does the US and the UN stand on the issue of sort of dealing with the Taliban, given the fact that they're the de facto government and that there is this sort of massive humanitarian crisis, which is sort of uh, brewing in addition to all the other problems the Taliban have inflicted on the country? Yeah, I mean, it's a huge and intractable problem. Uh, it's difficult for the UN. It's difficult for all of the member states who are dealing with it. Um, we often would look at it from the point of view of the Taliban's compliance with its obligations under the Doha Accords, uh, you know, to ensure that there was no uh, potential projection of threat from Afghan soil against the international community. I think the uh, US operation that killed uh, Ayman al-Zawahiri last summer uh, in Kabul uh, proves that the Taliban uh, were not in compliance. Uh, we, the monetary team has regularly called them out for that and they've always maintained a sort of a, a, a non-credible denial of this. I think the point is that this sits alongside other issues like human rights issues, uh, female education and, uh, and, and so many other things that they uh, are doing. Um, we mustn't lose sight of the fact that we have leverage, we should use leverage, they should not be allowed to uh, just wait this out until the international community loses interest. And so in every conversation that people have with the Taliban, they should be saying, what about female education? What about uh, the relationship with terrorist groups? Um, and, and the last thing I'd say about this, though, is that nobody, I think, can realistically say uh, that the Taliban has to be removed. I mean, the international community has just been through a long, expensive, painful experiment which has ended up with the Taliban in power again. So somehow or other, you have to find a way of uh, ensuring that that doesn't lead to unless unnecessary humanitarian suffering. And my advice, and this is the advice I used to give uh, it, when talking on 1988 issues in the UN, is look to the neighbors on this, because neighbors have no choice. If you're Pakistan, if you're Iran, if you're Turkmenistan, if you're China, uh, if you're Uzbekistan or Tajikistan, you have no choice but to figure out some modus operandi with the people across the border. So it's, the important thing is to put those neighbours in the forefront of how you exert pressure on the Taliban and what concessions you make in order to drive behaviour change and to cope with the situation on the ground inside the country. We have another question from Ramaya Campbell, which is, what, a, what about the possibility of US domestic designation of multinational far right groups that have a US presence, like the Proud Boys? Um, Melissa, do you wanna take that? I think, sorry, could you say that one more time? I missed the well, last one. So, I mean, uh, basically the question is, you know, I mean, some of these right wing groups have an international presence Yes. Um, I mean, there were some Americans who went overseas for training with far right groups. I and mean, so it does that open a window. The Trump administration, to its credit, designated the Russian imperial movement. Um, and that was a group that had, I think, I believe it attracted some Americans. So does that open um, up a door a bit uh, on this question of designation of far right groups by the United States? I mean, I think it could, but I, one of the things that we saw in our report is that there's less of a tendency to designate far right groups compared to jihadist groups. And that's across the board. I mean, David, you know, please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so I, I think the hardest thing is, I think the point that is actually made within the question is if they don't have kind of international geopolitical aspects to them, then how can we designate them? And then it goes into the, the more complex conversation around US law and domestic terrorism versus international terrorism and all of the nuances to those laws that I think have been debate, debated, of course, by International Security Program and many other organizations time and time again, um, which makes it very complicated. So 
I would say theoretically there is a door open, but based on what we've seen historically, there's this freedom of speech aspect, which kind of reframes everything in a way that says, well, it's, it's, it's more civil issues. It's not necessarily going to be violence uh, when we think of terrorism uh, kind of writ large. So I'm not, I'm, I'm not even cautiously optimistic about it. I would say theoretically the door's open, but I'm following what the pattern in the U.S., for example, has been historically with designating groups. You know, on that I don't point, know how you, the rest of you feel. I'm not a lawyer. So I but just, okay, I just, one, one, one quick thing to David. Is, uh, you know, so there are laws on the books in the United States about you, you can't just form a militia movement. Yeah. <laughs> an armed militia movement and those laws have been around for a long time and so mm -hmm. there are there are laws other than sort of designating them as terrorist groups which you could use against uh these kinds of armed groups if they really look like if they begin begin to behave like a domestic militia uh, david yeah i just wanted to say um i think currently that door is sort of shut and i think there's some very good reasons why people have sought to keep that door shut. I think it certainly could be opened if people really wanted to, um, but opening that door comes with a range of consequences. And I think one of the lessons of this paper is that those consequences are often far reaching and may not be immediately visible. But in this particular case, we, I think, know that one of the consequences of trying to shoehorn domestic designations in and pushing against the U.S. reticence to designate domestically is that you open the door further to um, designations that some may not like. For example, Trump's effort to put Antifa on the, um, the exclusion list, which was itself sort of a similar way to shoehorn around the legal and social norm prohibitions on um, designating domestically inside the U.S. In the, in the last minute, I just had another real world question for the ambassador, which is, you know, Tur Turkey is blocking Sweden's entry into NATO or making it very hard or as far as I can tell, based on the fact that they regard Sweden as being overly permissive to a group that they, a Kurdish group that they see as a terrorist group. So these kinds of designations have real world implications. Do you have any thoughts on where the NATO thing will end up with Turkey, or is it hard to predict? No, I'm guessing that, uh, that 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 a solution will be found. I think I think usually that does happen in that in that kind of uh, in that kind of uh, uh, arena. Um, but I think it is a, it's a, it is an important reminder of the need not to be careless in tossing around allegations of state sponsorship of terrorism because. You know, you can you can see this in so many places. Uh, you know, these, these sort of these sort of tit for tat allegations have been made between so many different member states, uh, usually about you know uh, groups that are uh, you know fled across a border or or, or, or to a more sympathetic uh, ideological environment where they can uh, thrive. Um, and if you take this to its logical uh, conclusion, you you run the risk of just uh, having states endlessly at odds with each other uh, about about uh, the fact that they're not completely uh, handing over everybody that that, that 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 member state would like to have handed over, um, and of course there are you know particularly if you're talking about a country like Sweden with very strong legal um, uh, constraints uh, on what the government can do. Uh, it seems to me that you don't want to set a bar, a diplomatic bar that is bound to fail in the courts. On that note, thank you very much, Ambassador Fitton Brown, uh, David Sturman, Melissa Salkirk, and a great report. And if you would like to access the report, it's uh, available at the bottom of your screen. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.